great to be in the house of the Lord today. Appreciate the invitation, opportunity to be here, and thank you all for your prayers. And that the Lord may bless, and that I speak only that which is pleasing and honoring unto Him, and that I may get out of my way and just have Him speak through me and what He'd have. Before we get started, I, I have to tell this little story and probably embarrass poor little Audrey just a little bit. But she was a baby, so she, she don't remember. But this is years ago, um, y'all had a missions conference here, and uh, we had come in and we sat in the back row there. The, that was just still a wall. They hadn't cut that out yet. And uh, there was chairs lined up back there, and uh, Audrey was only just a few months old at the time. And so I'm holding her in my arms, and, and we're right back there along the wall. And out in the middle of preaching, the, the building just goes completely dark. I mean, just all the lights. Doom. <laughs> and so we're all kind of looking around, and I look over, and I had Audrey on my shoulder, and her little hand, she had reached up and turned that light switch off. <laughs> And, uh, she's just a few months old. She had no idea. And I was like, oh, sweet. <laughs> Turn the lights back on. I lost power or something. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, just so thankful to be here. And, and we do pray for Brother Lafferty and for Justin and Brother. Mark and Debbie and Brother Cantu and, and others that, uh, that are out there with them. And we just pray the Lord bless them in their journeys and keep them safe. And, and we also pray that the Lord might bless their, their time and, and his work and his word going going forth over there to uh, those. And uh, that they may may take it and spread his word further to, to others. That's a, a great work. That's what we're all here to do is to spread the gospel of Christ, to, to teach his word and, and to spread his gospel to others. Amen. If you have your Bibles today, please turn to uh, Matthew chapter 22. We're going to look at a little bit here. I, I guess if uh, I would title this, I guess I would call it uh, Christ Silences His Adversaries. Christ Silences His Adversaries. And where uh, you can put a, a marker in, in Matthew 22. We'll, we'll jump around a bit to some other scriptures that, that we have, but uh, we'll start in verse 15. Matthew 22 and verse 15. It says, Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. The Pharisees here took counsel against Christ to see how they might entangle him. How they, they, they gathered together for the sole purpose of devising a plan mm -hmm. that they might try to use the words of Christ against himself, entangle him in his talk, you know, and, and, and I thought the, the foolishness of man to think that they could outsmart God, to think that they can take Christ's own teaching and his own words against him, to snare him. And not, not just the foolishness, but also the pride. The pride built up in, in, in these to say, you know, we'll, we'll use his words. We'll entangle him. We'll find a way to trick him. So built up is man in their own thoughts and ways sometimes that they, they think that they can oppose that of God and his teachings. And, and uh, these Pharisees here thought, you know, we'll get him. We'll get Christ here. Um, they thought they might pull one over. And it, that's the thought of the, the lost, is it not? Mm -hmm. Because they despise the word of God. They don't understand it. They don't get it. The Holy Spirit has not worked in their hearts and lives. And the Lord has not come into their life to where he has saved their souls. And, and, and we wouldn't either if we were still lost. I mean, what a blessing it is to be saved. You know, Brother Jared talking about the sacrifice, the one that, you know, sin was brought into the world, but there is one that came and, and saved from sin, and that one is Christ. And thank the Lord that, that if you're here today and know him, there's no greater thing to be known than to know that the Lord saved your soul. Right. 
So the, the, these Pharisees here, these ones that took counsel, the, the, they thought, you know, they despised the word of Christ. They thought, well, we'll, we'll trap them, we'll snare them. And uh, turn to uh, Psalm chapter 2 real quick. Look at Psalms in, in chapter 2. You know, this is nothing nothing new to the world or to, or to Christ or to God as, as people try to use and, and twist and, and work against God and his people. But in verse 1 of Psalms 2, it says, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Against the Lord, the kings and the rulers take counsel against the Lord. And not just against the Lord, but against his people, against his anointed. You know, sometimes in this day and age, we, we think sometimes we, we've got it different than, than any of God's people has had through, throughout all the time. It's nothing new for the world, for the kings and the rulers of the lands to try to devise a plan that would go against God, to go against his word, against God's people. Oh, it's been shown throughout the eternity here of, of this earth. They took counsel and they set snares to plot against the Lord. And they will for us too. We're followers of Christ. And, and they, they'll try to trap us. They'll try to right. use Christ's teaching against us. Amen. And what we follow and what we believe. So let us be mindful of that in our walk for Christ, in our, in, a, in our journey through this land, because this is a pilgrimage. This is not an eternal home for us. Right. And hallelujah, praise the Lord, that it's not. <laughs> because we have a better home. We have a heavenly home, those that know the Lord and Savior. But let us be mindful of that, that they will. The enemies of God will try. In verse 3, it, it, it's, you know, verse 2, it says, The kings and rulers counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, in verse 3, Let us break their bands asunder, cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. You know, they take counsel to, to try to break away, to try to reject Christ. You know, let us put asunder the cords. They, you know, we, this was back, David uh, here was in, in the book of Psalms was writing this. But we see it in today. We see how they want to break asunder. They want nothing to do. The world wants nothing to do with Christ. They, they want to break those cords. They don't want... They don't want to hear it. They don't want to, certainly don't want to live by it. Those rulers and kings, they rebel. They want to cast away the courts of Christ. They want to act like he doesn't exist. They, they want to go their own way, do their own thing. But I, I like in verse 4, He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. He that sitteth on high, the Lord God, the, the, the one and only almighty God, there's no outsmarting him. There, there's no getting past him. There's no taking his word and turning it against him. They tried. They seek to overthrow him. But the Lord on high shall laugh. He shall put them in derision. He shall put them in contempt to scorn the way of the wicked. And a scary place for them will be, as he said in verse 5, then shall he speak unto them in wrath and vex them in a sore displeasure. Well, that's a scary place to be. We'd be in the wrath of our Lord Jesus Christ and, and his Father. Micah chapter 2 says, book of Micah in chapter 2, it says, Woe to them... In verse 1, Woe to them that devise iniquity and work evil upon their beds. When the morning is light, they practice it because it is in the power of their hand. And they covet fields and take them by violence and houses and take them away. So they oppress a man and his house, even a man and his, and his heritage. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, 
Behold, against this family do I devise an evil, from which ye shall not remove your necks, neither shall ye go haughtily, for this time is evil. Oh, woe unto them that devise iniquity. Many workers of iniquity around about us. Many workers of iniquity throughout the history we see in the accounts that the Lord gives. And you know, in the book of Micah here is, it is talking about a, a specific time of judgment against um, the house of Israel and their sins and, and, and for the, their idolatry. But you know what? That same God that, that had wrath upon them is the same God that still rules. The same God that is on high, the same God that laughs at those that, that try to scorn or mock him because he is the one and only God, the all-powerful. Woe unto them, there's no escape. It may seem like they get by from now. You know, the, the wickedness that, that can surround us, the way of the world, it may seem that they devise evil and practice evil. We see it daily. But just as was a promise here in the book of Micah, in verse 3, where it said, from which ye shall not remove your necks, no one will escape the judgment of God. All shall bow and realize at some point in time that he is God. And then it's just a matter of, as was taught this morning, where will you spend eternity? There's only two places. Heaven and hell. Turn back to Matthew chapter 22. So they set counsel. They sought. Their only purpose was to try to act against Christ. To try to seek to trip up Christ. Verse 15 in Matthew 22. Then, then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. And they sent out uh, unto him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Master, we know that thou art true, and teachest the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. Tell us, therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Show me the tribute, my and they brought unto him a penny. And he saith unto them, Whose is this image and superscription? They say unto him, Caesar's. Then saith he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. Mm. All the wicked do this, that they, they set others. You know, they took this counsel in verse 15 to entangle them. They sent out unto him. They sent others out. To Jesus to try to ask him this. You know, we see that, that, that Satan is the author of confusion. He, he tries to bring that confusion. He tries to, to work in the way of, of um, that which would be against the Lord, but to try to uh, confuse and, and, and false ways that are proclaimed. And, and we see many, you know, the world's full of those that are proclaiming false ways. And the Bible warns against following cunningly devised fables. And verse 16, you know, we see that they that they lie here. They well they they tell the truth, but they don't believe it. You know, they, they're trying to, you know, they're trying to, to lie, they're trying to pull one over on Christ. They, they say, you know, Master, we know that thou art true, and teach us the way of God in truth. You know. They say that. They, they, and with their lips, they're speaking. We know that you're, what you say is true and, and your way is that you're a God of truth. But they don't believe it in their hearts that they're saying this to try to set up Christ at this time, to try to entangle him in his own words. You know, Proverbs 26, verse 23 said, burning lips and a wicked heart are like a pot shirt covered with silver dross. You know, dross is, is, is that impurities of, of the silver that, that come when, they, when, you, when you heat up the silver and the impurities come out, float to the top. All the lips are trying to cover the deceit in their heart. They're, they, you know, they're speaking the truth, but they don't believe it. They're speaking it to try to deceive. What they said is true. God is truth. His way is truth. 
what they're doing there to try to get him, to trap him in here where it says, For thou, it says, Neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. So they, so he's saying, you know, you speak God. You speak the, the way of God in truth. And you say that God careth not for man, or, or man's ways are nothing. That God is over all, and, and man is, is nothing. And, you know, God says that he is uh, not a respecter of persons. So they're, they're trying to bring, bring this up to, you know, what they thought would be a plan to snare him. And it says in verse 17, Tell us, therefore, what, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? So they're saying, okay, God, you, you, in Christ, you preach God. You preach the truth of his way. And if man is nothing, is it lawful then to give unto Caesar? Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar if man is nothing? And you're saying that, that um, you preach God the way of truth? You know, can, can't you almost just picture in your mind the, the smugness of their look when they, when they said this? And uh, they're probably thinking, oh, we got him. We got him. He's, he's you know, Christ preaches God. And, and yet, is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar if you say man is nothing? But verse 18, but Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Oh, the Lord wasn't fooled. See, because the Lord knows the heart. The Lord doesn't judge based purely on what is said. He saw right through them. He said, why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? He knew they weren't real and they're saying that, Lord, we know you speak the truth, so is, is this lawful? They weren't, they weren't coming to him with a real sincere question to be taught right and wrong. They came to them with a, a wicked heart and lying lips. That's what they came to him with. Yeah. And he saw right through it. The Lord knows the heart. Look over at Mark chapter 2. Read through a few verses here, but uh, bear with me as we read through the first 12 verses here of Mark 2. But I just love this account, and it just, it just furthers the, the point of Christ knowing the heart. Mark 2 and verse 1, it says, And again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house, and straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him, for the press they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why doth, why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, thy sons be forgiven thee, or to say, rise and take up thy bed and walk? But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. He saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, arise and take up thy bed and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw it on this fashion. You know, can you imagine those that got to witness Christ on this earth and his workings and his miracles? You know, and I, and I just, I, I just imagine as we exit our journey here and get to be forever in glory with him, how our eyes will be opened as well of, you know, we never saw it on this fashion. There's going to be, there. You know, the Lord has blessed us in so many ways to give us his word and to open our eyes to certain things. But there is so much more to Christ and, and to God than we will ever understand on this earth. And I think we will spend eternity just being astonished 
by him and glorifying him and praising him. But, but I love this account because the faithfulness of these men, this, this one lying in, in this bed, sick of palsy, that had to be carried by four people. They couldn't even get to Jesus. He, he, was, he was so surrounded with a mob of people around as he taught and preached. But we, we see that Jesus knows the heart because one, he saw their faith. You know, he was so surrounded. The only way they could get to him, they went, they climbed up on the roof and tore through the roof and lowered this one sick of the palsy down. That's the kind of faith they had that they knew the only one that could help this man was Christ. This one sick of the palsy, the faith he had, Jesus saw their faith. Jesus knew their heart because he said, son, my sins be forgiven. The faith of those that brought him and the faith of the one sick that knew Jesus could help. But we see there was also certain ones, certain scribes sitting there, reasoning in their hearts. Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? They were reasoning this within their hearts, thinking this within their minds of, how does this man, what is he speaking blasphemies? Only God can, can save. And in verse 8, immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, they didn't have to speak it. <laughs> they were reasoning this within their hearts, and Christ perceived it. Christ knows the heart. There's no tricking God. There, there's no getting one over on him or trying to snare him in a, in a, in a plot because Christ knows the heart. And he, you know, can you just imagine, I would imagine the, the, the look or the shock uh, of these scribes when, when Jesus said, you know, why reason ye these things in your hearts? <laughs> Could you imagine? I mean, they were, these were inward thoughts. These were things that they thought inside their hearts and their mind. And Jesus said, why think ye these things? Can you imagine the shock on the, on the, the face of the scribes? Yeah. But he knows the heart. Christ says, which is easier? Is it easier for him to say, thy sins be forgiven thee? Or is it easier to say, get up, get up thy bed and walk to heal him? For Christ, it's one and the same. He has the power to heal sin, to forgive sin. He has the power to heal physically. You know, his gospel went forth. In verse 10 it says, But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Mm -hmm. Isn't that great? Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. Jesus Christ came to this earth and he had the power to forgive sins. 1 Samuel 16. First Samuel 16 and verse 7. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. You know, man tends to focus on the outward, what we can see. You know, we're, we, we can be deceived. We can be easily deceived as people. The Lord seeth not as man. The Lord looketh on the heart. The Lord knoweth the truth that is in every one's heart. Are they a believer? Are they not a believer? Are they real in their worship unto him? In what they say? Are they real in their teachings? Throughout, throughout ages, man has thought they can get by God, that they can fool him. I mean, that's, we see it. He's given us account after account in his uh, word here of, of how man thinks that they may be able to fool God. But they can't because the Lord sees the heart. There's no hiding from God. He knows the truth of one's heart. And so he knew the ones that had faith and he knew the ones that did not. And that account in Mark is just so blessed. I just, I just love that account there as, you know, one that the ends that, that those that sought Christ would go to because they knew he was the only one that could help them. And then how his gospel witness went out there 
as he silenced the scribes when he said, why reason ye in your hearts this? He knows our hearts today. What condition are we in? <clears throat> you know, we can, we can fool each other. We can, we can put on a show for our families or for our church or, or whoever we associate in with this life. We can fool each other. We can't fool God. Okay. He looketh past that outward appearance. He sees what's on the inside. Turn back to Matthew chapter 22. <clears throat> when he said, why tempt, in verse 18, why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny. And he saith unto them, whose is this image and superscription? And they say unto him, Caesar's. Then saith he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. When they had heard these words, they marveled and left him and went on their way. Oh, Christ silenced him, didn't he? Silence the adversaries. They marveled at him, at his words. You know, he said, Bring, bring me the tribute money. And so they did. They brought it forth. And he said, Whose image is on this coin? They said, that's Caesar's. They said, you know, basically, this is a coin from, from this country. So th this is, this money, this tribute money, it has Caesar's image. It belongs to him. Give unto Caesar's what, it, what is Caesar? Caesar's kingdom was an earthly kingdom. And so he said, pay the dues that were unto him. It's his. Pay his dues. See, they were thinking worldly. They thought they could snare him in this trap, and they thought, well, you know, if Christ teaches God is above all, you know, is it lawful then for us to, to give tribute unto Caesar? And Christ said, give him what is due him. Give Caesar what is Caesar's. See, he had an earthly kingdom. Christ has a heavenly kingdom. Christ spoke many times on the kingdom of God. And so I think that's why they were trying to use it. I thought, okay, we could get him here. It, you know, is it right for us to give to this earthly king if, if God is the king? Well, yeah, because it's this is just money that belongs unto, unto them at that time in his country and to Caesar. He said, give it unto him. It's, it's his. Render unto the things to Caesar's that are his. But he didn't stop there. But look at, look at Mark 1 real quick. We see, um, we see in verse 14, Mark 1 and verse 14. Now after that, John was put in prison. Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Christ preached it. Christ proclaimed it. He taught the kingdom of God. Now is the time. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe. See, the Lord spoke about the kingdom of God many times. Um, way too many to, to, to go into in, in one message to go look at every account as, as he preached the kingdom of God. But, you know, get your concordance out sometime or, or whatever Bible program you may look up uh, the word kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven. Christ taught on the kingdom of God over and over through his earthly ministry. And so back in, in Matthew 22, they thought they had him because they thought, oh, okay, well, he's preaching that, that God is over all and that, that you know, God's kingdom is, is the one that, that is over all. And that's true, it is. So they said, Should, is it lawful to give unto Caesar? See, that it, man's knowledge is so limited, isn't it? Thinking worldly, thinking earthly, thinking, okay, we got him. It says, Master, you teach the way of God. You teach the way of the kingdom. Is it lawful then to give tribute? Well, Caesar has an earthly kingdom, so give him his earthly dues. But he doesn't stop there. He said in verse 21, and unto God the things that are God's. See, we have a responsibility to give unto God what is his. 
we we have a responsibility as citizens of the United States. We pay our taxes unto them. That's an earthly nation. God's kingdom is a, is a heavenly kingdom that is made up of his people, those that he has chosen, those, those that he has called and, and saved through his son. Give unto God what is due unto him. You know, and when they heard these words, they marveled. And that's what jumped out of this account that was just so fantastic is they started this out in verse 15. We're going to entangle him in his talk. We're, we got him. We're going to trick him by his own teachings. And by the end of this, after they questioned him, in verse 22 it says, And when they had heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. Oh, we'll entangle. We'll use his own words against him. But when Jesus was finished, they marveled at his word. They were astonished at his word. They, they realized they could not stand against him. The same word that they thought they would use against him, Christ used to silence them. Oh, their plan failed. They went their way, defeated. You know, in this chapter, we, we won't worry. We're going to jump down and, and further into this chapter a little bit here, but... There's, there's other accounts of them trying to ensnare him and trap him by his words. But we see every time they tried to test Christ, he stopped them. He, he, he rebuked them. He used his words. They thought they could use it as a stumbling block against him. But he used his words to, to get his truth out. In verse uh, 34, we see it again. Matthew 22, verse 34. But when the Pharisees had heard that he'd put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. See, they just kept trying. They, 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 they brought up the Pharisees earlier and, and tried to take those to get counsel against them. Then they sent the Sadducees uh, to try to uh, trip them up. And then now here in verse 35, then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, that thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Oh, the great commandment is to love the Lord God first. Put him first in our lives. And to love others second. You know, he said, Christ said, hang the law on these two commandments. You know, we, we can live a, a, a life the way we should if we live it that way. If Christ is first and then we love one another second and we serve Christ and put him first in our lives. But we see here after this, Christ gets to ask a question. He said, so while they were getting, verse 41, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, you know, they've been trying to catch him. They've been trying to ask him questions, see if they can't test Christ and get him to, to uh, contradict himself. So he says, let me ask you a question here. He says in verse 42, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They say unto him, the son of David. He saith unto them, How then doth David in spirit call him Lord, saying, the Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then call him Lord, how is he his son? And no man was able to answer him a word, neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. <laughs> oh, isn't that, isn't that great? Mm -hmm. So he says, How? The Lord knew what their response was going to be already when he asked this question. But he says, what think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? And they said, the son of David. See, they're still thinking earthly. They're thinking a, the human lineage. Christ's earthly lineage did go through David. And so he says, well, how, and so the Lord says, well, how can that be if David calls me Lord? See, because even though Christ's earthly lineage went through David, 
David is, as anybody else that is saved, a child of the King, a child of God. He is of Christ's lineage, just as we are today if we know him. And so he says, how can that be? Then doth David in, his, in spirit call him Lord, saying, And the Lord, said unto, the Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand. God the Father said to, to God the Son, Sit at my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. That is Christ. If, in verse 45, if David didn't call him Lord, how is he his son? You know, so he, he posed that question to those, and they had no answer. He said, if David's calling, calling me Lord, how then is, is David his son? Look in, look in 2 Samuel real quick, verse 23. 2 Samuel 23, we see uh, some of the last words of David. We won't read through this here all the way, but just the first couple of verses. It says, uh, Now these be the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse, said, And the man who was raised up on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob, and the sweet psalmist of Israel, said, The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. The Spirit of the Lord spake by me. David spoke as he was moved by the Spirit of the Lord. He recognized the Lord, called him Lord. That is how David was able to call him Lord and still be his son. Christ's earthly lineage was through the house of David, but David was able to call Jesus Lord because the Holy Spirit had worked inside David's life. Because the Holy Spirit worked in him, he spoke as he was moved by the Holy Spirit. And the same is true of us today. Look in, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Ye know that ye were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols, even as ye were led. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus a curse, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. We can only recognize Jesus as our Savior in Christ because the Holy Spirit has worked in our hearts and our lives and, and showed us that wonderful truth. And as we repent and believe and trust on the Lord Jesus Christ, we now get to call him Jesus, our Savior, our Lord. No man can say that unless the Holy Spirit working within. Just as David, the Holy Spirit spoke by him. It's the same way for us today. If the Holy Spirit works in our hearts and, and, and brings us unto him, we can say that he is our Lord for that reason. And no man would call Jesus a curse that has the Holy Spirit. It takes that. It takes the Holy Spirit to be saved and to recognize that he is our Lord. Back in uh, Matthew 22, verse 46, it says, And no man was able to answer him a word, neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. He silenced them. Unable to answer because the Holy Spirit was not in them. If the Holy Spirit was in them, they would have recognized how David could call him Lord and how he could also be his son. You know, man thinks so much of himself. So built up in pride. We see it all over. Sometimes even in our own lives, we can sometimes get back in that fleshly nature of pride. But he humbled. We see that Christ stopped them and humbled them. They didn't ask him any more questions. You know, they'll challenge. The world will question. They'll try to use Christ's words against them. 
You know, just as Psalm 2 said, that the council together against the Lord and against his anointed. You know, they're, they're going to take counsel against us because we are Christ. We are with Christ. We belong to Christ. We are his. They're, they're, they will take counsel against us because they took counsel against Christ. So they're going to take counsel and, and of those that are against Christ. Christ had the truth. Christ silenced them. But you know, yeah, Christ was, was God in the flesh. Something that only he could ever be. No one else could ever be but God in the flesh. So Christ had the truth to battle, to contradict his adversaries, to silence his adversaries. But you know, Christ gives us his truth, his words that today we can use against our adversaries. His word that as he's given that we can battle to face those that may oppose us. You know, they only oppose us because they opposed Christ first. Like I said, we are Christ's children. We are his people. Let's close in Ephesians chapter 6, if you would. Ephesians 6 and verse 13 it says, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. God gives us what we need to stand in this day. Gives us his word, gives us his, what we need for our defense, the whole armor of God. Amen. To defend ourselves that we don't compromise. So when those that would seek to take counsel against his anointed would come to challenge Christ's people, we can defend ourselves. We have that armor. And he also gives us our only offensive weapon, which is his word, the truth. None of this is, it may be written by man, but it is all of God. Yeah. That his true inspired word that he allowed and used his people to record that we today in our lives can stand against those that would try to oppose us those that would try to twist the words of God to, to stand against us, we have the word of God, which is our sword. You know, the world will never accept us because we are not of the world. But when, may we always remember how Christ silenced his adversaries with the truth of his word. And may we take his truth and his word and use that to silence our adversaries in this day. May God bless his word.